in order for people to get their lives back together, uh, there's got to be a great deal of, of uh, help coming from the federal government. And uh, federal emergency management, FEMA, is already on the scene. And so this morning, in order to walk through all the steps, uh, because again, I'm, I'm reminded how long it's been since uh, you know, Hurricane Ike came and people have had to go through this process. Uh, this is a, a new process. It, if you ask people, how do you fill out all these federal forms, you know, I start to wobble and things like that. But the, the man who's here is working with Harris County in order to coordinate the federal response and specifically also to help with individual assistance because Lord knows we're going to have a lot of people who are going to need assistance uh, following this, uh, this storm. So I would like to introduce uh, Tom Farzion, he's the branch director for Harris County for FEMA, and he's going to start uh, walking everybody through the process of what comes next when it starts uh, time for federal response. Thank you. Tom? Thank you very much, Judge. Good afternoon, everyone. First of all, I would like to start out by offering from myself and the entire federal family that we share uh, in your grief, your sorrow, and your loss. Uh, with this uh, tremendous disaster that has happened in the state of Texas and, and in your county. Um, you're in our thoughts and prayers, but there is one heartening thing in all of this, is that it never ceases to amaze me how communities like yours with the, the judge's leadership, the state leadership, but the individual people come together time and time again and begin to help themselves. And, and that, that is just remarkable for us to continue to see. I see that all over the country, but never as well uh, or any better than I've seen here uh, these last few days. The most important thing that we from the federal government are doing in support of state and local efforts is continuing to rescue people, is to ensure that people are safe. So everything that I say from this point on is caveated by the fact that people need to get to safety, they need to follow the direction of state and local authorities to achieve that. Everything else follows from that. So please, that is critical. I don't want people trying to register, trying to do other things, putting them or their families in danger. So they have to get to a place of safety first, and then we'll talk about how they register and how they, how they get into the system. So FEMA really will provide uh, a, a number of uh, types of assistance, uh, and, and I'll just break those down very quickly for you. What's important right now, after we get beyond the rescues, we get into that initial uh, life-sustaining and recovering periods, is our individual assistance programs. That are our programs that are there to help individual members of the community, to help the survivors directly. And every survivor is not eligible for every part of our grant process. But what we do is we encourage everyone, everyone in this county, and in affected counties in the state to register with FEMA. And the best ways to do that right now is to go online. As you can imagine, there's a significant impact on our phone lines, and the internet right now is the best way to get to us, and it takes some time to go through this process. So if people go to disasterassistance.gov, that's disasterassistance.gov, that should be the primary way they get into the system. Again, when they're in a safe, secure location to do that, they can get to the FEMA app on their smartphones. Everybody seems to have those, and those systems have stayed up pretty well. So if they get to their smartphones, or if they have a smartphone, they can go to the FEMA app, and it will direct you uh, as to how to register from that point. They can also call the FEMA uh, helpline, and it's 800-621-3362, or 800-621-FEMA. Those are the three best ways to get in touch with us and in the order I provided them. What we are partnering with the state and partnering very closely with, with Harris County is to get people out of the situations they find themselves now. They're out of their homes. They have been displaced and get them into safe, sanitary, and secure housing, and that is a process. The first thing we will do is get people sheltered or get them with loved ones, do the things that are ongoing. Again, most of this is driven by local government, local organizations, with state support and FEMA support on top of that. 
in support of those sheltering activities, in support of the needs of people not sheltered but isolated, we have delivered to this point almost 2 million liters of water. We have delivered very close to that number of meals. We have engaged in, in personnel to assist uh, in getting people registered in the shelters. So this is an ongoing process, but again, FEMA does not do this on their own. We do this at the direction of the state and local government partners. The other part of the FEMA process has to do with how the government gets relief from their damages. That is something that while uh, not immediately impacting individuals, it does impact the ability for the community to come together and FEMA programs and processes are already engaged and then we do have our mitigation programs and mitigation efforts that will, with the monies provided, help local governments and local communities like Harris County, like the state, prepare and, and mitigate against future disasters. And those programs are driven by the, the local government and their state counterparts. Um, I guess right now I'll just open it up to any further questions or any questions anyone may have for me or the judge. Sir. Can you talk a little bit about planning that FEMA and local governments are doing for housing post-shelter for the next stage of the process? It's my understanding that in addition to trailers and things like that, FEMA now has a agreement with HUD for an apartment voucher program. Is that something that's likely to be stood up here in the future? FEMA has a number of programs to get people into housing in that first step beyond shelters. And we will be examining all of them. Um, they have uh, appointed uh, an extraordinary individual to come down and manage this part of the recovery program for FEMA, and we will be developing this. But right now, nothing is, is off the table. We are looking at all eventualities. This is a tremendous disaster in terms of size and scope, and there's millions of people engaged. We will be looking at unique ways to house people, and our traditional ways, sir, to your, to your question, certainly involve transitionary housing and transitionary sheltering that's moved people uh, into hotels, moved people into apartments. We have renters assistance. There's a number of things that we can do, and then we will look at other housing um, potential as we go forward. And, but I want to get the thinking beyond the traditional um, uh, methodologies that you've seen in the past. We, we are really going to be open to uh, new ideas here, new ways of looking at this. So, um, sir, you had a question. Yeah, um, just to follow up with that. Uh, I, it has already started getting people to hotels on traditional ways uh, of housing beyond the first shelter set. How many people are in some of these uh, other hotels, apartments, other people? Okay, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry. So the question, sir, was how many people are into those next step yes. solutions? Uh, I do not have this morning's numbers with me, sir. I'll, I'll be very honest with you. But we have moved, uh, I believe, thousands of people into hotels. And we are continuing to expand that program. And we will be identifying rental assistance, which may be difficult in many of the communities here because of the size and scope of the flooding and of the of the disaster. So I don't want to quote exact numbers, but I will tell you we are actively engaging in every room, every possible uh, method that we have immediately available to us. We are plugging people in. So what is it What is it that you're doing right now, today, to help people move to that next step uh, and beyond the rescue? And can you talk about the size and scope of this effort historically? Okay, the question is, what are we doing right now, and what is the size and scope historically? First of all, we are taking the steps that I talked about. We're working with state and local government. We're getting into the shelters. We're getting people registered. We're providing follow-on supplies, wraparound services for local government, for state shelters, so that we can, in fact, get people as safe and secure and sanitary there until we can move them to a better location. We are engaging hotel rooms throughout the state to move people to that, and we are working with our state and local partners to engage uh, rental assistance or those next steps. But I am not going to tell you that we have those final solutions yet because we don't. And in terms of your question, sir, I have not yet seen the full scope of this to make comparisons, but let me offer this. 
while this is a very large disaster and, and seems to trend towards those historic disasters, it really doesn't matter what happened in the past except as something for us to learn through, by and to take all of those lessons learned and apply them here so that we serve you guys better than we have served people in the past or as well as we have served people in the past. So you may move people from this area, at least temporarily, to other parts of Texas just because that's where you can house them, at least temporarily. I don't know that that's the case, sir. That is something we work with the state and local counterparts. Do you want to? Yeah, we, we certainly don't anticipate that. Uh, there, I think there's a, a little <laughs> bit of uh, confusion might be the right word. Dallas and San Antonio have shelter operations going on. Uh, a lot of that's from people who were got the direct hit of the hurricane, where their communities are gone. Uh, we will make every effort to keep people here. I mean, that's that's the whole purpose, and that's why you know FEMA is embedded in this in this place. I will say the the early on, uh, Tom mentioned going into the the shelters. We know those people are going to need assistance. They're kind of self-identified because they're in a shelter. There are a lot of people, a lot more people, by a factor of who knows how much, that don't yet know if they can go back into their home. And as soon as they are identified and they come in and say, I can't get back into my home, then they'll be making application to FEMA for that. But right now, I, th I think it's safe to say most of these early efforts are geared to those people who are already in shelters or have already been identified as not having a place to live. I have a question for FEMA. We have a large uh, immigrant community. Can you explain who qualifies for assistance? Okay, the question is we have a large Im immigrant community. Who qualifies for assistance, ma'am? Is that correct? Yeah. And let me be clear about this. We are here to serve everybody through not just our own, and, and, and I want to be clear about this. We represent not FEMA. I'm here to coordinate the federal government response. So while FEMA programs will assist immigrant families, and we have specific guidelines as anything else, but we will work with our state and local counterparts. And, and an old ops chief I work with used to define as this. He said it's a patchwork quilt. He says we will build with the BOADS. We will build with state. We will build with local people. We will do all of those things to, in fact, excuse me, to, in fact, ensure that people are well taken care of. How do, you, how do you ensure, or how do you get money to people quickly to help them, at least in the short term, while at the same time assuring that they're not taking advantage of the system? That's complicated, isn't it? It's always complicated, we will always err to the side of caution, we're guided by policy. We, we have our governmental agencies that help us, you know, weed out anyone who, who, you know, corruption in the system. Uh, but the real issue here is we can't do anything until people register. Once they register, we begin the process and we do casework with each individual, each individual family, individual units. We work with all of those and try to tailor our response to their needs. Are you giving them cards? Will you give them vouchers? How, to, how? There are a number of ways that we can approach that, and it will be dependent upon how the person sets their life up. Again, I want to be very clear, we respond to the needs of the people the best we can. Some people have direct deposits, some people don't. So they're, they're, we have to work within their reality to the very best of our ability. So there is no one answer to that, sir. How, how long can it be assistance uh, registration to know how many people have so far so far? It has been open since IA was first declared the state in the, the first hours or days of the disaster. And how many people have sort of made applications? Uh, I think we've got 260, 270,000 uh, people registered, and we've got 97,000 people that have already been in the system and received some type of assistance. I have a viewer's question. If they have damage to their home, for example, to the roof, should they go straight to their insurance, to the home insurance, or to FEMA? Always go to your insurance. 
all right, flood insurance, homeowners insurance, anything that may cover the various parts of this disaster, but register with FEMA and let the caseworkers work out what FEMA help may or may not be available to them. What's your ideal timeline? Are we talking hours from registering that the response to FEMA, days, weeks? We will begin to help people the minute we talk to them, get them into the system. After that, the timeline is dependent upon their needs. That's if you meet with them in person. What if someone signs up online or through your app? How, how it's the same thing. We have professionals in a call center taking those calls, filling out those applications, getting them into the system. Again, casework starts from that point. But if they sign up online, how soon can they get a response? The question was from me, if they sign up online, how soon will they get a response? That will depend on the volume. Okay. But when we try to get to them very quickly, generally we do it within hours, certainly within a day. Okay. So within 24 hours, if someone signs up online, they can expect typically to talk yes. to somebody who can start walking them through this process. Typically, that's correct, sir. Do you have plans to open any uh, centers or mobile units to help people register? Or, uh, make okay, the question is are we going to open uh, mobile units or fixed sites to register people? The answer is yes. We're working with the local government and state to identify the best places to serve the needs of the people. And we are actively out in shelters now registering people with our folks with uh, our, our own iPads and things to get that information, get them into the system. How many folks do you have out of registering people? We've got four or five teams out right now just in this county in the mega shelters. I think what I keep hearing, and maybe I'm wrong, is that we're still so early into this that a lot of the answers to our questions don't exist yet, that you're still working on various options and the best way to help people as quickly as you can. Is that fair? That is fair and that is clear and that is concise. As I said, there are certain things that we can do right away. The size and scope of this is going to require other things to, to be looked at far broader and far more strategic, but we are doing it with a sense of urgency and intensity that meets the needs of the people. For homes that have been damaged, are there, is there any plans to uh, sort of help people repair those homes or conduct those repairs? We have done that in the past. That is something I'm certain that we'll look at. But again, these things need to be examined in the context of the entire disaster, and we, we don't do anything on our own. This is all in combination and coordination with state and local requirements and needs. To be determined. That's my point. We are executing what we can now, but we are wide open as to the possibilities to meet the need. And we always try to do better. Always. Uh, yes, sir. Yes. Just generally, I mean, if, if, if someone's out of their home right now, they're probably wondering like, how long am I going to be out of my home? I know it probably depends on what kind of time I would want to be out for someone. Depends on the damage to their home. Depends on their own resources. Again, I don't have an answer to that. People have to register to begin to work through the process. All right, let, let me ask one last question because it comes up all the time. Uh, FEMA trailers. Yes, sir. Are there FEMA trailers? We, we have ordered FEMA trailers. There are FEMA trailers in stock. But again, I want to be very careful how we couch that. That is one possible solution. It is not necessarily the only solution. It is not necessarily the best solution but it is part of our toolbox. And can you, can you spell your name for us so that we have it properly? Sure. F is in Frank, A-R-G-I-O-N-E. First name is Tom, Thomas. Okay. Thank you very much. Let me make, let me take this. The, the reason I asked that question about the trailers, uh, if you remember back around the time of Hurricane Ike, the FEMA trailers were discovered to have formaldehyde, and so they were. We had all these trailers, but we couldn't use them. And now there are some trailers, but as Tom said, that's not the, by far the only solution. And, and those of us in the energy capital of the world have been talking about the fact that the energy industry is able to put up camps in the Eagleford Shale fairly quickly to, to house the workers and. And we're talking about every possibility. I mean, those could be uh, utilized, not saying they're used. They could be, but not necessarily. This afternoon at 3.30, uh, there will be another press conference that will be by VOAD, the Voluntary Organizations Active in Disaster.
and those are all the groups that also come into play in helping people get on with their lives. You know, we, it's sun shining and gosh, it's bright out there. Uh, keep in mind people in Beaumont and Port Arthur and parts of East Texas are still going through what we went through just a couple of days ago. So uh, this, this storm is, is still on us and still in Texas. But what we want to do here is get on about people's lives as soon as possible. Um, uh, can't say enough, FEMA, for being here as quickly. Uh, they've, they've been embedded in, in the Emergency Operations Center with us. They've been very helpful. Uh, and in fact, sometimes help means saying, I can't do something. And the example of that was uh, the setting up of the shelter down at NRG. Uh, FEMA was here, they were ready, and the, the, but like everybody else, the, the assets that they wanted to put on site just couldn't get here simply because of floods. So that's why we did it the way we did. Uh, going forward in the future, uh, FEMA's promised, and, uh, and I know these are promises they can keep, that they will come in and backfill and supply those, those shelters or whatever we need. So I wanted to be sure that people understood that the federal government is here, uh, and they do have a process started, and I think you heard the thousands that have already signed up. Uh, the magnitude of this event is so far beyond anything we've dealt with in terms of sheer numbers. Uh, if I could ask you, and I, don't raise your hands, please, but you know, I could ask you in this room, how many of you had some damage during this storm? And there are a whole lot of us that did, me included. So, uh, and frankly, I was sitting there going, oh, I need to go register for assistance. Uh, so everybody needs to be aware of that. So thank you very much, and we'll see you at 3.30. Judge, one question. Yeah. How are you doing? I'm doing fine. I mean, you know, me personally, my family, uh, uh, I did have a daughter and her three children. The husband insisted on staying and, you know, kind of monitoring the house, but daughter, three children, dog and a guinea pig that were taken out by boat in the Braze Heights area. Uh, just one of many. Uh, the rest of us, uh, I didn't have water in my home, uh, but uh, you know, the rest of us are fine, but this is, this is such a massive event, and it's still ongoing. Don't forget, we've still got the reservoir situation where homes are flooding in the western part of Harris County that have never flooded before. Uh, and that's got to be, you know, it's always a shock, and it's not easy for anybody who's got water in their home, but if it's happened to you before, you don't like it, but you kind of think, well, here it is again. But if you've been in a place where you've lived for 30, 40 years and you've never had water in it and suddenly water's in, I mean, that, that's just got to be devastating to you. And I understand that. And that's what's going on still as we speak today, even though it's bright and sunshine. So we'll get through this. Thank you all.